Well, John, thanks for inviting me um, to this conference. Um, having read the papers, I'm going to learn an awful lot myself today. Um, I noticed a lot of those papers have health warnings on them, that this is a first draft, not to be submitted, and so on. I forgot to do that with mine, but I'd better say it is very much a first draft. I had to knock it together quite quickly, um, and for that reason, at least partly for that reason, some of the arguments are rather ramshackle. But at least I hope I've identified a real issue, if I'm still not quite saying the right things about it. Now, when the issue of exemption, a religious exemption, arises, typically various considerations have been weighed against one another in deciding whether the claimant should receive an exemption or things considered. But there's general agreement that there's one thing that should not figure in that weighing process, and that is an assessment of the plausibility, reasonableness, or validity of a belief. Rather, that has taken a face value. Now that's what I've described as the no assessment principle. So I said, a court should make no assessment of belief, plausibility, reasonableness, or validity. Provided a belief is sincerely held, it must be taken at face value. Now there is one qualification to that that Julian's already mentioned, and that is that for a belief to get into the game, as it were, to be eligible for accommodation, it has to be consistent with uh, human dignity and integrity. So there are outer limits set to substantive outer limits set to the beliefs that we can get through to consideration. But that's a different issue from the one I mean to raise. That concerns a belief's moral acceptability not its well or ill-foundedness, and those are two separate matters. So a belief can be ill-founded, but entirely morally acceptable, or it could be theologically well-founded, but still be morally objectionable. Now, in addition to the human dignity and integrity consideration, there are often other tests that are listed. In the paper I used the famous test of Lord Nichols and Williamson, but most of those tests concern form rather than content, um, and they're intentionally uh, undemanding in character. So I think I'm right in saying that the position remains that a claimant's belief is not to be subject to any objective test of plausibility, reasonableness, or validity. And that seems to be not only a judicial orthodoxy, but to be widely accepted amongst liberal political theorists who write in this area, like Cecile, who's unfortunately not here. Now, some years ago, when I first started to work in this area and came across the no assessment rule, I thought it was balmy. It just struck me as very odd. Is it really the case that somebody can come along with a belief no matter how weird it is, no matter how ill-considered, how implausible, and still have it taken seriously as that belief, just taken at face value. <clears throat> I remember saying to Peter Edge at the time, that sounds to me like a nutter's charter. But, uh, and Peter, of course, put me straight, but it still seems to me, in a way, that, that, that rule, as I said here, that principle is counterintuitive. So if it's justified, what justifies it? And that's the, the question I want to ask, the issue I want to interrogate to in, in the paper. Now, this is how I set the issue up. We have a believer, B, who is an adherent of religious faith, X, for example, Roman Catholicism. He believes that X requires him to do Y and not to do Z. He claims an exemption in respect of Y or not Z. Now, on the argument I'm presenting, B's right to embrace faith X is not in question. So, well, ill factors does not apply to the general place of the embraces. But suppose we have good reason to hold B's belief 
that x requires them to do y or refrain from z is actually mistaken. These believers, in that sense, ill-founded. Should the ill-foundedness of these beliefs make no difference at all to his claim to an exemption? And in the paper, I give a number of examples. I'd, actually, I'd like to give rather more better examples, but I give it some examples of the kind of case, I think, which raises this issue. Now, one is a case of um, Muslims working on tills in supermarkets who won't handle alcohol and handle pork. And um, Sainsbury's at one time exempted those people from having to handle those goods and so did Marks and Spencer's for a while. But Marks and Spencer's soon encountered public protest, like Sainsbury's did, and Sainsbury's took advice from Muslim authorities and was told, no, Islam does not require, does not make it wrong, haram, to handle alcohol or pork. And that, for that reason, Sainsbury's dropped his, his, his practice. A more recent case um, is of a four-year-old girl in Birmingham who was sent to a Catholic primary school wearing a hijab. Um, that caused a kerfuffle as well. And I think there, much of the book, what drew the attention was that it's contrary to what Islam actually requires. Islam does not require girls to cover their hair, if it does at all, until they reach the age of puberty. So in a sense, sending a, a four-year-old child to a school wearing a hijab is simply not just so, it's ill-founded. Now, those two cases didn't go to law. Um, a case that did go to law, but, but a very old one, uh, that of Mr. Sanders. This is back in the days of the clothes shop. And he claimed that as Jehovah's Witness, he was forbidden from joining a trade union. Now, at the tribunal, an expert witness from the Jehovah's Witness, Je uh, Jehovah's Witness Church testified there is nothing in the doctrine of the church that makes it wrong for a Jehovah's Witness to join the trade union. In spite of that, Mr. Sagger's view prevailed. Now, if in cases like those, we are under an obligation to remain blind to a belief's ill-foundedness or well-foundedness, why is that? What is the ground of that obligation? Uh, I think there are two types of reason, reasons of principle and reasons of pragmatism. I'll take them in turn. So first of all, reasons of principle. How could there be a principle, uh, what kind of principle argument would, would support the no assessment principle? The most obvious one is the moral right to religious freedom. That is the idea that if he were to assess somebody's belief, find it wanting and allow it to affect our decision, that would be a violation of the person's rights, of these rights in my previous example. Um, so that's neatly summed up in Lord Nichols, another sense of freedom. Freedom of religion protects the subjective belief of the individual. But what I want to ask is, is that, or perhaps I should say, should that be true of law? Is that the way the law should operate in the case of religious belief? Now, there are two respects in which religious belief is not typically subjective. Um, yeah, I, since I've got a bit more time, I'll, I'll just say a bit more about this. Um, in the paper, I try to make that point by contrasting it with a way of thinking about conscience. Um, very often when people, uh, you know, there is a way of thinking about conscience, talking about conscience, which makes it very subjective, subjective in two respects. One is, it is the subject, the conscience holder, um, who is a source, the sole source of what conscience requires for that person. And I think that's unlike religious belief, in the case of religious belief, most commonly, the source of people's belief is outside of themselves. It lies in sacred texts, in the doctrines of uh, established religion, a community uh, of faith, and so on and so on. And secondly, conscience is often associated with a kind of relativism. That is, it's often accepted, look, people's consciences speak differently to them, but they should still comply with their consciences. Therefore, what it's right for one person to do, 
won't be right for another person to do. So that conscience is objective in that relative sense. Now again, that doesn't apply to religion in its own self-conception, at least not ordinarily. Um, as I have it there, um, yes, the believer doesn't, the religious believer does not suppose that a belief is correct for him only if and because he believes it to be so. So religious prescription is not typically an exercise in self-legislation. It's simply altogether more objective than that. And of course, assumption cannot be that correct belief for an individual must be what that individual supposes it to be. It can't operate upon that assumption because A, that's a cause for the truth of, of religious belief as we know it. Sorry, for the fact of religious belief as we know it. And secondly, if they use that assumption, that would itself be a kind of theological stance, which is just as well thing, of course, that they shouldn't have to do. So, um, I just want to make this simple point that it seems to be just obvious there's great scope within a faith for knowledge, learning, expertise, informed interpretation, and so on. <coughs> but by the same token, there's scope for ignorance, error, and misconception. I think it's very odd to deny that. The second point I want to, uh, to make is <coughs> that sort of judgment is an issue here. It's not a first order moral judgment, the judgment of whether X requires Y or forbids Z. It is a judgment of fact or interpretation. And therefore, when we assess that, it's not like violating a primary dictated conscience, it's not a moral matter at all in and of itself, even though it has moral consequences. Now, if Cecile were here, I wrote this to Cecilia, I'm sure she would say, but look, the badness of having to act contrary to your beliefs, or having your beliefs burdened, is independent of whether the belief is well or ill founded. <coughs> you might argue that on psychological grounds, that the, the pain, the anguish of having being unable to, to act according to your belief is quite independent of whether the belief is well or ill founded. I would prefer not to put it in those psychological terms myself. I'd rather appeal to the idea of integrity. But if you take the idea of integrity, well, again, it doesn't matter whether a belief is ill-founded or well-founded for the way in which it bears upon a person's integrity, a person's conformity to what that person believes. Now, that I accept entirely. But it doesn't follow from that, therefore, that... Um, the ill-foundedness of the belief does, is unaffected by those affected by the belief. So I'm not I'm getting myself confused here. Um, or I'm not saying these clearly. Uh, let me, uh, one thing I haven't said, which I try and emphasize in the paper, is that I think the thesis of that ill-foundedness only arises against a certain sort of background. It doesn't affect an individual's right to hold the religious belief. You know, I mean, in human rights law, the right to hold a belief is absolute, and nothing I say challenges that. Nor does it, in ordinary circumstances, affect a person's right to manifest their belief. Um, Mr. Saggers can, is free to manifest his belief by avoiding employment that involves joining a trade union. Um, Muslims are free to manifest their belief that it's haram to handle alcohol or pork by avoiding forms of employment that involve doing those things. The issue I'm raising uh, arises only when my religious belief comes up against other people's legitimate interests, and there's a competition between the two, as is typically the case when you're considering exemptions. And what I'm saying, given that other regarding dimension, this thing about that, the ill foundness of a belief making no difference to integrity, is not conclusive because if it because my argument is one about a belief affecting other people and then it does become their business. I'm oh, sorry, no. I need to 
get back. Yeah. Um, now something else, I don't say enough about this in the paper, is something else that's mobilised in this area is Kantian ideas of respect. Um, the idea that uh, allowing people to live according to their own beliefs, uh, the freedom of, of belief and so on, is an elementary requirement of respecting human beings in consistency with the idea of, of human rights law. However, I don't think those kind of arguments, again, are decisive in this area. And I'll just to limit myself to a kind of parallel I can give with the claims of culture. Um, in the political philosophy literature on exemptions, uh, exemptions are characterised variously as religious or cultural. <coughs> what I should say is they, they flip-flop between the two. So what one writer might call a religious exemption, another might call a cultural exemption. And it's often supposed that, in a sense, those two are a piece, and the same thing is applied to them. But I don't think they do always. Well, let's see. Um, suppose I claim that a practice is a part of my culture, and I go on to register a claim of indirect discrimination on grounds of my ethnicity. In that case, my claim is properly subject to an objective judgment. Am I a member of the ethnic group of which I claim? And is the practice I'm claiming for a practice of that ethnic group? That's an objective judgment, and if a court, when a court rules on that and finds against me, I cannot see how one could plausibly argue that's a gross act of disrespect. It would just seem weird. But, but equally then, in that case, if we're willing to accept that, why should, not, why should it be any more outrageous that a court should take a faith like Roman Catholicism and judge whether it really does entail X, so it really does entail Y, or the not delivered Z. So the sum of all that is that um, I'm not persuaded that there is a good in principle argument which makes it would make it wrong, morally not legally, for a court to assess a person's beliefs and, and as well allow that assessment to affect whether it grants exemption or not. But then on to more pragmatic reasons. Now I'm going to be quite brief about this. In the paper I huff and puff a bit about um, the issue of whether it really is the case that courts are incapable of doing the kind of assessment I'm talking about, um, whether it's impossible to do it or whether it's simply inconvenient. Um, judges are always protesting that it is and in the end I come down to accepting look, um, there are good reasons why courts should avoid getting entangled religion insofar as they want to but they're this time that if they would do that it would be very demanding in time and effort, heavy reliant on expert advice um, given the internal diversity of religions often it would be an uncertain exercise a difficult thing to do and, of course, there's always this question about evidence and logic as they apply to within religion. And then finally, um, these would be areas that would be contentious, controversial, attract claims of bias, the kind of thing that courts don't want to get themselves involved in. Um, so, perhaps unsurprisingly, I do come to the conclusion that there is a pragmatic justification if there's not a moral principle justification. But, as I say, the justification is found not the high peaks of moral pixel, but the jobby foothills of pragmatism and prudence. Actually, perhaps I should have said lowly, rather than grubby, because it's a ten ten minutes. Um, having done that, I, I go on to look at whether there's a proxy test we could use for well-foundedness, rather than testing for well-foundedness directly. Uh, and the most obvious proxy test is to use a group. So does the group believe so and so? If the group believes it, that indicates well founded. If it doesn't, it's ill founded. Now that a group test not used in that way, but that sort, is found in indiscrimination, indirect discrimination law. And I say more about the paper than I really should, because I'm interested in that area. Um, but really it comes down to two fairly obvious problems. One is the problem of how you identify the group for the test case. And of course, there's already an issue in indirect discrimination law as it is. Um, 
Now, when I make a claim of indirect discrimination, uh, I have to indicate not merely that I have suffered discrimination, but other people like me will suffer discrimination. And the question is, well, who are those others like me, the other persons? And that can be defined in various ways, which can have a radical effect on the, on the judgment. And the second thing is simply that a group test is quite obviously, I think, a very unreliable indicator of well foundedness not ill foundedness So I just don't think some proxy of that kind would do the job for us. Oh, sorry, yes. um, so there it is. My conclusion is that um, pragmatism justifies no assessment rule rather than principle. But there is one implication that follows from that, and that is religion, religious belief will sometimes get more than its due. It will sometimes enjoy exemptions to its in principle, the ill foundedness of the belief gives them no right. But I think that's a moral loophole we have to tolerate for the sake of pragmatism. Thank you.